everybody for being here. I had the opportunity last fall to uh, visit Turkey for a couple of weeks and get to see a number of places that I've wanted to see most of my life. And uh, let's see if we can go over here. So we um, flew into Istanbul and then changed planes and went down to Antalya, which is in the southern part of Turkey. And did a couple of, uh, a couple of tour segments. Uh, the first one was just right there along the coast uh, outside of Antalya. And we'll I'll kind of begin there. And then the second one took off and cut up and kind of went along the uh, western coast of Turkey and then finally ended back up in Istanbul for a few days. The um, interesting thing, I guess, that I, I kind of found as I was traveling there was just how, how much history is laying at your feet as you're walking around. Uh, I'd been to Rome before, and Rome, Rome is one of those places where you kind of walk from one space to another, and there's a whole jumble of everything, and you're never really sure what age this thing was and that thing was. Uh, it's a little different in Turkey in that you have all the things that are kind of current in, in the major cities. There, there are still some, some of the cities still have some of the ruins right in them. But so many of the ruins that, um, that I visited, anyhow, were out in the middle of nowhere, essentially. It was not in an urban space. And so you were just walking around in the landscape, and you looked down at your feet, and every little piece of stone had Greek writing on it, and it had been laying there for you know a long time. And so initially, when I went and was looking at all these places, it was kind of from the standpoint of one of the things I'd always wanted to see were all the different stadiums and uh, some of the large constructions. And when I was going to speak last spring, that was kind of the direction this was going to go. But as, as things changed for this fall, a different kind of context, I'm coming at it from a different way. And in the process of doing that, you're still going to see some of those stadiums simply because I spent a lot of time in them uh, trying to get images of them. Uh, but more from the standpoint of water and its relationship to these various cities. The five cities that we're going to kind of visit today are Patara, Termesis, uh, Perga, Hierapolis, and uh, Ephesus. The, each of these cities has a different history. Uh, three of them are very long-lived uh, cities. You can see from this particular example running from, say, 1500 BC almost to 1500 AD. Uh, and in fact, um, they may well be a lot older than the 1500. It just, it's kind of where most of the archeology span is. Um, Termesis and Hierapolis, not as much archaeology has been done on them, and so uh, particularly with Tremesis, they're not sure when it started. They just haven't done any work there. Hierapolis, they know when it started because it was a, a planned and built city at the time. So that's kind of what we're going to do. Is I'm just going to work through these in that order and kind of discuss uh, what happened in those places. And some questions to consider as we go through this. Uh, number one is what role did water play in the establishment, success, and eventual demise of these ancient cities in Anatolia? Which Anatolia, by the way, is, makes up the more major portion of modern-day Turkey. It was uh, that portion that it was uh, previously named. How did these cities adapt to change? Uh, what limits to adaptation resulted in the eventual failure of these cities, and what questions should we be asking about our current cities, infrastructure, and long-term planning? Because one of the things that you notice as you go from ancient cities to present cities is that there's not a lot that's changed when you start looking at the things that are there. And so we may do them a little differently, but all of the same things are present. 
So for this first portion, uh, three of the cities are located in this little southern loop. And we began in Antalya and drove down to Patara, which is down here in this lower corner. And currently is a really wonderful place if you want to go to the beach. They have beautiful beaches there. There's a lot of sand. Uh, but the city is actually up a ways from the beach. And uh, a number of these sites, the ones that were actively uh, undergoing research, had models built of the, the major structures uh, involved in those cities. And so this is a, an image through a, a case looking at the city of Patara. Uh, north happens to be to the left in this image. And we'll, kind of, we'll look at the north gate. There's an aqueduct that comes down to that gate. Uh, it distributes back into the, the site. This is the harbor, or at least was the harbor, let's put it that way. And this was a river harbor, and the river then flowed down this direction uh, to the sea. From the harbor, there's a harbor street that runs up into the site. Uh, there's a colonnaded street that would have had shops and so forth, uh, central bath, harbor bath, a number of, of baths in the city, and then the, the main agora. Uh, this would be the bulletarion or odium, uh, the senate and concert hall, and then the theater. Uh, so these are kind of the things that have been uh, exposed on the site and that they've actually done some restoration work so that you see some of what was there. And then further down, as you got out to the coast, you would see uh, this major lighthouse. It was some 100 feet tall um, that um, was knocked down by an earthquake uh, around uh, 1460 or so. So here's an image of this north gate. This is the entry into the city. The, uh, you can't see a whole lot next to it. You notice that the uh, soil, they had to excavate down about three or four feet to get to the level of the street. And pretty much the entire site is kind of buried under that much earth. And so what they have exposed is uh, where they have cut away the earth in order to, uh, to do that. And so obviously it takes time to accomplish all that. Um, you would be coming into that, into the city then, there would have been this wall, an aqueduct coming down uh, from your right. And this was all added to the city, uh, beginning with uh, Emperor Claudius. So this would have been the mid first century. And it had not been in Roman control for a whole lot of time at this point, and they were investing money into this city, getting the water supply there, expanding facilities. Um, and so from this, this point, water would then be distributed, actually some from the gate directly to this first main fountain. As you walked into the city, you'll see in a moment. And then others are distributed off to some large uh, tanks where they're then distributed to the rest of the city. This aqueduct uh, travels about 22 and a half kilometers to get to the city, uh, delivering water at that point. And you can see in the structure of the gate itself where water would pass through the gate and then would be a part of the, uh, the overall system, both from the water traveling along the top, water traveling through pipes and so forth uh, through the, uh, the wall and into the city. Viewing from the north toward the south, this is where the, the, there was a large octagonal fountain that you would approach immediately as you entered the site. Now looking back from the south toward the north, you can see the gate. And here to the left is the central bath. Each of their baths were divided into three major rooms. You had the, basically the cold room, the tepid room, and the hot room. Uh, this particular one had heated floor system. It was subsurface heated floors. Um, you know, very, very contemporary in its, in its design. 
um, and this would be Harbor Street. Harbor Street, uh, they have been excavating on. It kind of ends right here. That's as far as they've gone. You can see the major width of this and then the colonnades on either side. This happened to be a pedestrian street. It uh, doesn't bear any marks from um, the wheels of chariots and so forth, and it was actually kind of closed at both ends through a, a narrow gateway. So this was all pedestrian use, and you would have uh, shops and so forth here on either side. All of this would be under roof, so kind of imagining this you know, totally enclosed boulevard um, as a very popular walk directly from the uh, harbor, which would be right down in this area where you see all these shrubs, um, and then moving up into the city toward, toward you as you're standing there looking at it. And you'd reach this house, and this area was the, uh, prior to being under Roman control, was the seat for the um, uh, Lycian League, and they were actually the first ones, you know, we, we think of the Greeks as being the ones who were starting, the ones who founded democracy as an approach to government. Uh, the Lycians were the ones who actually uh, first introduced federalism. And so each of their member uh, cities uh, would send a representative and they would have a certain number of, of votes each. Uh, it was, I think, three per um, city and this is where they would gather uh, and then coming a little bit further south uh, actually you get to the theater overlooking the site again there's the north gate way off there in the distance um, central bass harbor street coming up the senate uh, it was the senate and basically the concert hall and then of course the theater over here on the left you can see a little bit down in here. This is where the river passes through. And all of that uh, has long since silted up, which actually was a part of the demise of the city because that, all that sand coming down due to uh, deforestation and uh, overgrazing resulted in the harbor not being able to be maintained. And eventually, the economy died. Uh, so people moved away. It just wouldn't work. So for Patara's history started somewhere around 1500 BC. Um, Alexander the Great came in in 333, took the city. As I said, it became the uh, Lycian League here around 196 and was the capital for uh, Lycia. And then it was annexed by Rome in 43. The lighthouse was built in 60. And then between 100 and 200, 300, that was when it was kind of its golden age in terms of its growth and so forth. Uh, and then it began to go into some decline. There was a major plague in the 500s. And then the silting of the, the river began to uh, cut back on trade. So it was kind of this lull down here in these last 500 years. And then there were a number of earthquakes that destroyed. Finally, the, uh, 1347, they had bubonic plague come through, um, wipe out about half the population. And by 1500, it was abandoned. Again, multiple earthquakes. This area was also affected strongly by tsunami. And if you go there now, there's actually only a, a a hostel and a few other things nearby where you can stay because it is in an area that is protected um, as concern for potential tsunami during earthquake uh, events in the Mediterranean. So that's the history of Patara. Now we're going to go just a little bit further around and we're going to visit uh, Termesos. Termesos was a very different type of city. Instead of being down near the coast, it's up on top of a mountain. And you can get some sense here of the view up in the Taurus Mountains. The um, wonderful location um, in terms of its structure, 
that had kind of a low entry area and then you you, that you, you did then and you do now, you climb some really steep trails to get up into the city. Uh, there's a number of uh, city walls that you would pass through when you finally get into the main part of the city. You can see over here there's a theater. Um, they had also the, the Bulletarian and Odium, uh, all the different types of um, places that you had in Patara, uh, but arranged somewhat differently. One of the things that they had to do a little differently than Patara, of course, being up in the top of the mountains, they had to really pay attention to how much water storage they had uh, in order to manage the area that they were in. Here's in a view to the, this was the uh, city gate as you would kind of climb up through this area. And this would be the upper, upper walls of the city. Again, major approach is through here. As I said, this area has not been, they've not done any detailed work uh, in this particular one. This is actually a colonnaded street. You, can't you see that? Uh, you really had to do some imagination uh, exercises out here. Uh, the earthquakes uh, really knock everything down and uh, the streets were very similar to other cities of that time. They would have a sewage system underneath the main street. Um, sewage would be piped to that and would head downhill. Um, water is then distributed by um, pipes from upper areas into the major structures. Of course, uh, fountains and so forth were sources for carrying water. They had a number of cisterns. This particular city was known for the depth of its cisterns. They had actually about 30 to 35 foot deep cisterns, which was a pretty uh, challenging um, feat up in this mountainous area uh, where you're having to go through solid rock to build a lot of this. In this particular part uh, of the city, there's uh, five different uh, divided cisterns in here where you could look down in and actually see a little of what was going on. Of course, it's all filled with rubble, but you can get a little bit of the, a view of one of the top of the arches of these deep cisterns. When you actually get all the way up to the top of the city, uh, that's where the theater is located. Actually, if you get over on this edge, you can see Antalya from a distance looking back that way. All of these theaters that uh, we'll kind of see as we go through these cities today were originally Hellenistic ones, so they're going to date from the 300s BC, somewhere in that period, but were updated through time, uh, expanded a number of times in uh, early Roman periods, and so you're seeing a, a kind of a continuity of uh, things happening. The view from kind of the Antalya side of it looking back toward the, the mountains off to the west. Uh, scale wise, you know, you can see the size of the, the stonework. They were uh, great craftsmen and, uh, you know, kind of a view for the doorway into the, the lower part of the, the theater. So this is really, when you see this, this is what most of the theaters look like. Uh, when you go through the, uh, the different cities uh, until the archaeologists come in and then they have in specific places done some restoration work. None has been done here. So Termesos, um, don't know exactly when it started. It holds the distinction of um, Alexander the Great not conquering it. He went to do so and um, had a skirmish. He said that they were an eagle's nest and that it wasn't worth his time, so he went on past them. Uh, he said it was, it was so well designed, there was no, it was impregnable. It could not be, be won. So he just allowed them to eventually be sucked into all that he did. Uh, but they, they kind of held on to that as a badge of pride and were very independent by nature. Uh, they became an ally of Rome in the um, 
the early 190s or so. And as a result of that, when Rome actually took control of the overall area, they were granted in independent status by the uh, Roman Senate. They actually minted coins that stated autonomous. You know, this was a very, very independent group. There was a major earthquake in 243 AD, and as a result of the damage of that earthquake, breaking what aqueducts they had, you saw the nature of the damage up there, uh, they chose not to rebuild and abandoned the site and moved down to other places. So it's an issue there of what is your level of technology, what's the cost it's going to take in order to get things restored, uh, and what is the will of the populace to do it. All right, the third city is Perga, and it's located on the other side of Antalya. This particular city was recognized in historically as one of the most beautiful cities of Anatolia. And one of the reasons for that uh, was really moving into the Roman period. They brought in a lot of water to this site and they chose, rather than just to have spaced fountain and bath facilities, they actually created a continuous uh, boulevard that had this descending, flowing uh, stream in the middle of it. It was uh, a tiered fountain. So you can kind of imagine there's these colonnaded, covered uh, areas along the, the right and left, uh, you walk it today and there's mosaics in there that was kind of the pedestrian portion uh, that then served uh, all the different units that were built off of it. Uh, and then this was in the center, much more the um, vehicular portion. And then as we will see here, periodically across these um, stones are missing on this side, but this would be where the water would be flowing down the center of this. Here's street, street over here. Um, there are places where pedestrians can cross and places where vehicles can cross. As a part of this major water infrastructure, they had the sewer located beneath this and then the potable water essentially would be up here on the top. They could clean it, they had these um, stones that they could remove that would allow the water to drain down through into the sewer and then they could clean the interior, stop it, refill it, and it would go on running. Um, you can get some sense here of the, they've kind of tiered it uh, as it goes down here so you'd have this cascading kind of effect as it moved down the street. And on the sides of the street, you know, as every good landscape architect knows who works in urban areas, you have to have all of your um, things for people to hang out. And you know, here you see their city benches. Nothing has changed, just the material, right? Here's one of the, the crossing points, a little footbridge. So you'd have the water flowing under this. Pedestrians would walk across. Notice the, the large pillars at each corner of the um, the crossing point. So, you know, if you've got chariots running up and down the street here, carts and so forth, uh, pedestrians have a safe place to come down this point then before they cross. And then in the upper portion of the street, um, of course, all along here, there's kind of the fountain components, there's the statue component, we've got little archways, a um, whole variety of things that are happening. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't hanging baskets, you know, and who knows what all uh, in there, things that no longer exist. It would be interesting to know. Up at the far end of it, this would be the starting point. Uh, there was a large fountain structure here, and steps would go up to the, we'll kind of go up there and show you that in a moment. But uh, water would be uh, flowing across this, dropping in, and then down through the, the cascade down the center of the street. The canal, essentially, is what they talk about. Um, so here is the, the place where the water is flowing in. 
And this is directly connected to the aqueduct that feeds this part of the city. You get some sense of the structure here on the back side and the view down the city. And you can kind of see the, the cascade divisions as it goes. And this is a reconstruction, imaginative reconstruction of what this was probably like. You can see that, I mean, everything had statues in it. Uh, but the central fountain piece would have been right here, water cascading down and then passing down the canal. It would have been rather impressive as you get up the street there. And so that was part of the reason for why it was considered this most beautiful city. In terms of the, the overall construction, you can see that there, here's a section. Um, a couple engineers had worked on kind of detailing how this was constructed and basically just using these dividers then to uh, hold water, to aerate it, move it, uh, and keep things moving downstream. The area beneath that is the sewer. Uh, and like I said, there's the plug for, you know, draining and cleaning. Uh, pipes enter from left and right into the sewer from adjacent units across the, the street. So everything was uh, pipe. They were using uh, baked clay pipe for uh, their piping. So for Perga, it, was, it, it may have been settled as early as 3500. This was an area of Hittite uh, control uh, early on. It became a Greek colony somewhere around 700 uh, from Rhodes. It was conquered by Rome in 188 and then entered its most, uh, it's kind of the golden age. And then by the 400s and beyond, it had a similar issue um, to uh, Patara in that the river silting pushed the city into decline because again, it was accessed by a uh, river and then it was abandoned by 1000. AD. Moving north from Antalya, north, northwest, I'm going to stop in Hierapolis. And Hierapolis was different from these other cities because its primary reason for existing was one of, um, I would say, somewhere between resort and medical treatment. So there were hot springs in the area. And the um, the Romans were very interested in having places where they could go and be treated for various uh, illnesses. And so they were on a, this kind of a high plateau that drops off down to uh, the river. And this is uh, the theater that uh, remains there at this point. Uh, it's actually in probably better shape than a number of the, the ones that I got to see. Um, if you look off to the left here, this area of this escarpment drops off and it is exposed to a, uh, where this, this water comes out of the hillside carrying heavy loads of calcium. And the, the nearby town is called Pamukkala, uh, which means cotton castle. Uh, referring to the whiteness of these structures that were formed. So the water comes out, deposits the calcium, and creates these interesting uh, form basins. And this is what attracted the, uh, the Romans to this place for its, uh, its health purposes. And people still stream there. Uh, there are a lot of hot springs in the area. There's a lot of spas and resorts. Uh, so that, that part hasn't changed. Not much of the city uh, th that we read about remains. Uh, there were a lot of baths. There were a lot of water structures uh, because that was the reason for going there. Uh, that work is still just getting underway. Uh, so you can see kind of the extent of these calcium structures out there. It's quite stunning in the sun. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's as bright as a white sand beach. The, we actually had, um, I didn't get a picture of it to show here today, but uh, 
they, they must have had an L.A. or somebody with that kind of a, a sense involved in creating this uh, visitor center over here because they picked up on those wonderful uh, circular forms and creating all the, the plazas and sitting areas around it. And so it, things haven't really changed that much except we've gone indoors for a lot of these things. As this is one of the spas there uh, in Pamukkala adjacent to the old city. And you can see then in the distance here the amount of uh, kind of vertical drop off. So the city sits, uh, Hierapolis sits up here uh, just behind all the white area. And this is that, that vertical drop down here into the river valley. It was founded in 190, uh, actually ceded to Rome in 133. The Romans began to rebuild it. Um, make it what they wanted it to be in the early part of the first century. There was a major earthquake in 60. It hit here and Laodicea. Um, they did a lot of rebuilding and then this was kind of the period of its uh, health focus, uh, 200 to 300. And then a major earthquake in 614 uh, did a lot of damage to it, kind of went into decline and by um, late or by the early 1200s it was abandoned there was an additional castle built um, afterwards which was then also abandoned in uh, 1334 so this was it had its its heyday then here in the early part of the the first three or four centuries moving on to our last site Ephesus out here, not far from the coast. Probably the best known of all the cities that uh, I visited. This was a major city in the Roman Empire. It was considered to be the second or third city of the empire. And in this little plan here of the city, you can see the harbor here. Here's the theater. There's a major walk from the, the harbor up into the city. Um, like most of the cities th that we were looking at there with uh, where they're doing the kind of research that uh, includes some restoration work, you're seeing only the major structures. But in Ephesus, they've been able to spend a lot longer and uh, had some additional funding to begin looking more at the residential structures of the city. Um, and there's a rather large development here. We'll see a f couple of shots of some of the hillside homes uh, going up the slope of the mountain here. You can see the gridded layout of the city. And so on all of these, when you see these major structures, you have to also kind of imagine that though they just weren't standing there by themselves. There was all of the people living in all the structures packed in all around that. So it was much more compact than what we see right now. There's the harbor. Again, one of these models. Here's the harbor walk. Um, similar to Perga, this is a little over a half kilometer uh, from the harbor up here to the, the theater. And then, of course, you would continue up. This is the Agora. Um, you come around and come up into the upper part of the city. There's housing up here on the, the hillside. This would be the uh, bulletarian odium structure, your concert hall type of thing, community meeting uh, place. Number of temples, number of fountains, number of baths. Um, we'll look at a little of that. In those hillside homes, you can see the terracotta piping. Uh, water was being distributed throughout coming off those uh, mountainsides they're bringing in from aqueducts and then distributing the water. Some of the wealthier homes, of course, would have water in them. Uh, others of the, the poorer type would not. Uh, you can kind of see some of the remnants of the, the walls and the, the floor finishings, the tiles. Uh, quite impressive. In addition to bathhouses, um, you can also see public latrines. Uh, this would have been a large restroom there in town. Uh, they didn't quite have the, um, the individual stall set up back then. 
But one of the things that you do note uh, in, in the way that they thought about all of this, of course, same structure again. The, the main sewer runs down the center of the street, um, uh, below ground. Water is then flowing through these latrines and is dumping into that underground sewer. And then, of course, is being discharged downstream. Um, but they didn't. These were, these were meeting places. Um, in, the large, in, in this particular large uh, latrine, you had in the center this uh, fountain structure. So there would have been water running in this, and they actually had places then for um, music performers to be there. So you had music in the restroom. You know, it wouldn't be Muzak, but it would be uh, definitely live music. Um, um, the theater, of course, is a very large theater. Um, it was developed and expanded over time. And you can kind of see here, this would be the view from the, the middle tier of seats back towards the upper part of Ephesus, which is behind this. Uh, the walkway would extend behind that and back that direction. Here's the view toward Harbor Street that would take you down to the harbor, which would be down right about down here. Now, unfortunately for Ephesus, it also had a big silting problem with its harbor. And the sea is now about three miles away. Uh, it has silted all that, that distance. Um, this would have been just a half kilometer walk down to the harbor rather than three miles. Um, kind of a view back toward the, the stadium. And the water supply for Ephesus was, was quite involved. They had four major um, systems feeding into the city. And two of them were based on baked clay pipes, and they were delivering essentially, what, together about 725,000 uh, gallons per day. There were two other long-distance systems, uh, 36 kilometers and 42 kilometers. These were a large masonry conduit system, and together they were delivering about six, uh, a little over almost 7 million gallons per day. So you were, you were managing to supply water for a lot of people. The population was estimated somewhere around 225,000, 250,000 people. Um, whether it was actually that large or not, I guess apparently today people are kind of questioning if it was actually that dense or not. But that was the uh, original understanding. They certainly had a water infrastructure that could support that kind of use. In the city, of course, the water is attributed by clay pipes, and the sewage was collected and discharged. Now, it, as far as its history go, it was founded in 1000 BC. The area was inhabited previously. Uh, it was taken by Alexander in 334, ceded to Rome. Um, the king of Pergamum, who had control over this area, uh, didn't have an heir, and he had a relationship with Rome, and rather than kind of see his kingdom be conquered type of thing, he worked out a deal and essentially um, ceded his, his kingdom to Rome, and this was a part of it. It became the capital of Asia in 27 BC, and of course rose to be the second or third city in the empire. By 600 AD, the harbor had silted, and you started to see a significant decline uh, in its use. There was also a lot of um, uh, the Arabs were getting involved. Um, at this point, there was a number of sacks uh, that occurred. And by 1,000, it was only a small village. So you go from this place that was truly opulent, and it's still impressive when you're there, to a place that dwindled down to only a small village. Now, still, it's over a long time scale. We're talking 1000, to, 1000 BC to 1000 AD. So if you go back to our questions and you think about what, what role did water play in the establishment of these, 
each one of them was located where they were because of the water sources that were available. It was either because of commerce, in terms of you know, access to shipping, uh, and or it was the availability of the kind of water. With Hierapolis, of course, it was, it was for uh, recreational and uh, health reasons. In terms of success, as long as the systems were there to maintain a constant supply of water, it was very effective. The Romans were excellent engineers, and they then made the systems work. And you think about all the construction of the bathhouses, the construction of the sewage systems, um, you name it. They were, they were excellent at that. The failure side of it, there were two major causes for failure. One was earthquake damage. And there was constant rebuilding going on as a result of that because of major earthquake events. But you think about the toll of that economically. Um, if the political will and the economic strength of the city is failing, those things aren't going to be rebuilt. And so the infrastructure fails and the city fails. Uh, the other side of that, of course, is environmental. And the lands there at one time were very heavily forested. And you go visit now, and of course, it is not a heavily forested area. Um, there was a lot of deforestation. And that, that along with overgrazing, particularly in the more heavily uh, populated areas, uh, resulted in those... Um, silting of the, the, the harbors and so forth. How did they adapt to change? Well, they found other sources of water and piped it in. How do we do that today? You know, you think about the systems we have today. Uh, we're not building with stone, which most of our stuff is lighter weight, uh, maybe a little more flexible. Um, so we've got some advantages there, but it's still subject to a lot of environmental uh, damage. And so you think about what would be the, the limits of our infrastructure, especially if you start looking at a longer time scale on our cities. We tend to look in 20-year plans, maybe 50-year plans. What's our thousand year plan? I mean, you know, I, I don't know how far out the Romans were necessarily planning, but these cities lasted a long time. And if we think on that scale, then do we think a little differently? What limits to adapt, adaptation resulted in the eventual failure of these cities? There's a variety of those. Um, and I think that comes back really to, it's so much to technology. Um, and in terms of the questions then we need to ask will really be about what, does, what will the environment bear in terms of Athens, let's say. We have a population in the area of say 100,000 people. Um, we have our water source is what? It's really surface water runoff and groundwater. Uh, so we have reservoirs, we're storing that. Um, it's kind of like Atlanta. You know, it's dependent really on Lake Lanier and, and the Chattahoochee River. Um, so what are the limits of those sources? Should we say Atlanta can't grow beyond a certain population as a result? Or do you reach out further and you bring in more resources? Is that sustainable? All of those things are questions that you can imagine that they were talking about at the same time. In order to solve some of their, their infrastructure issues, they had to come up with siphons in order to move water over topographical areas that water wouldn't normally be able to flow over. Um, so what are the challenges that we need to face? Comparing all of these different cities, of course, there's a lot of differences between them. There's a lot of different challenges they faced. You had various plagues that occurred and, you know, I don't know that COVID would be considered a plague necessarily, but it certainly impacted us in the way that we lived. And it's certainly had an impact even on our infrastructure uh, in new and somewhat unique ways. 
Um, so nothing has really changed. All the same issues still come up. How are we going to answer them? And you know, the question will be, looking back, um, how did they answer them? And can we learn anything from them? And I'm just going to kind of leave it with a question in that respect. But thank you.